Next item is recognition and acknowledgments. Commendations. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, recognition and board commendations in our meeting. Um, our first commendation tonight goes to uh, our Looking at our district staff, commendations to Mason Ali Bazi, Executive Director of Staff and Student Services for her phenomenal work, figuring out which staff wanted and still needed a COVID vaccination, and then coordinating the vaccines for more than 1,400 staff members. This was a massive undertaking and uh, all done in a very short time frame. Commendations to Carly Wall, who also works in HR, who worked late and on the weekends and on several days to help with this task. I know Dr. Maleko did mention that kind of already, but it was in the commendations, so we wanted to make sure that we included it. Commendations to Katherine Jaffer, uh, Alexis Newman, Administrative Assistants in the Superintendent's Office, uh, Fadia Fahid, uh, Supervisor for Software Applications, and Dr. Ross Groover, Curriculum and Professional Development Consultant and VLP Coordinator. During the last several weeks, uh, these dedicated staff members fielded hundreds of phone calls, made countless updates and changes, and worked tirelessly to enroll students into the virtual learning program. Special thanks to Joanne Oliver and Katie Hetrick and all of the sec secretarial staff at the schools for their assistance during this transition of learning. Combinations to the following staff members in the adult education department, uh, Alham Farhat, uh, Samir Hadar, Safer Beydoun, Safa Beydoun, uh, Syed Sarini, and Mark Shepard. Uh, through the COVID crisis, these individuals have conducted registration both in the fall and winter, working four nights a week from five to nine, handling assignments and registering students. So they've been doing an outstanding job. Uh, but what we don't always know is, is what goes on behind the scenes. And during this time that they were doing their jobs and showing up every day and doing everything, um, all of these individuals uh, just happened to be facing some very personal crisis and tragedies in their own families. And despite uh, so many personal things going on, they were persistent to make sure that the adult education program kept going. In fact, they were able to register more than 1,050 students, uh, a process that is very time consuming. Uh, each student has to, uh, is, is completed a learning plan uh, being addressed and then getting trained on using a computer and on Zoom. So it's not just signing some forms to get these students uh, registered. Um, on a side note, uh, our adult and community education program is one of the biggest and most robust programs in the entire state of Michigan and is uh, recognized by other adult and community education programs around the state for the outstanding job that they do. So kind of accommodations to all of that staff. We do commend uh, these particular staff members uh, for their dedication during this very troubling time. Uh, their commitment speaks volumes about their character and special thanks goes to uh, Iana Garrisi, who is the adult and community education supervisor for her outstanding leadership of that program. So moving on to our high schools, commendations to the Fortson Student Safe Driving Committee and lead teacher, uh, Heba Abdubeki. Uh, students created a Safe, safe Drives Save Lives uh, campaign and received funding from the Ford Motor Company Strive for a Safe Driving Campaign. The Fortson Committee was able to design and order more than 150 yard signs that will be placed around the community to encourage safe driving. And uh, students will launch a social media campaign as well that will include their peers at Dearborn High and Etzel Ford. If you check out the superintendent's one minute message found on Instagram, uh, you will see that he did a special one minute message all about the safe driving campaign. And if you wander by the administrative service center, you'll see the safe drives, save lives sign out in front of our building as well in support of that program. 
Accommodations to Dearborn High School Athletic Director Jeffrey Conway, who has reached the 10 years of service mark as an athletic director. Mr. Conway was recognized by the Michigan Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association with a dedicated service award. In addition, the organization uh, also recognized the district athletic director, Scott Hummel, uh, for reaching five years of service as an AD. Congratulations to Etzel Ford student, uh, Brianna Bates, who was awarded the Van Patrick Award, recognizing her as the top female athlete in the city of Dearborn in 2021. Also congratulations to Dearborn High's Charles Frank, who received the Van Patrick Award as the top male athlete in the city of Dearborn. And finally, uh, this was actually in the minutes of last meeting, uh, but uh, it was not officially read, my fault. So uh, to make up for that, we want to give a very special commendation and thanks to uh, Gita Burks at Henry Ford Elementary, and she's also on the DFT executive board member. She was among uh, a select group of educators who met with Governor Whitmer on January 13th. And these teachers uh, shared their thoughts about taking the vaccine, online teaching, and how teachers feel about returning to face-to-face -face instruction. Very important dialogue, and we appreciate her taking the time to be part of that very important conversation. Once again, we wanna thank all those uh, dedicated staff members who give so much to this district, all for our students. These are the commendations that were forwarded to the communications office and shared with all of you here this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mustin. Next item, please. Acknowledgement of donations. Thank you very much, Trustee Moza. Uh, we do have several common, uh, donations, so I'll try to move through these as quick as I possibly can. A donation of $884.40 has been offered to Eunice Middle School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for glue, note cards, scissors, cardstock, and markers. That sounds like a lot of fun. A donation of $1,000 has been offered to Salina Intermediate School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for 250 copies of the Wild Robot book. A donation of $889 has been offered to Miller Elementary School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for the PATHS Paths program. Okay, got that out. A donation of $359.94 has been offered to Salina Intermediate School by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for flexible seating. A donation of $7,000 has been offered to the Special Education Department by the Dearborn Education Foundation to be used for engaging staff in social emotional learning, a project for all. A donation of 20 Meyer gift cards totaling $1,500 has been offered to Dearborn Public Schools by Meyer. The cards are to be distributed to select staff members as a show of appreciation for all of their work during this pandemic. So we wanna thank Meyer for that. A donation of $100 has been offered to Salina Intermediate School by Fairlane Ford Sales to be used by the eighth grade boys football team. A donation of a MacBook Pro has been offered to McDonald Elementary School by Donors Choice to be used in a classroom and a donation of Welcome Vikings Yard greeting signs has been offered to Smith Middle School by Sign Gypsies. Uh, these are to be used to welcome students on their first day of school. And I believe they did because we saw them, uh, we did see some out there. A donation of 12,000 children's face masks have, has been offered to the Dearborn Public School by Mayor O'Reilly's office to mask to be distributed to each student age eight and younger. We saw these masks, they're really cute. They have teddy bears on them, perfect for the little kids. Um, all right, so the next several donations are being made in memory of a uh, of Mr. Jim uh, uh, Bajian, Bajian, Mr. Jim Bajian. Uh, since his family was so kind to direct any memorial contributions to Salina Intermediate, I felt that it was only appropriate for us to know a little bit about Jim. Um, so just a little background uh, about this gentleman who uh, all these following donations are being made in his memory. So Jim 
Like so many who, uh, who have and currently live in Southwest Dearborn, he was the son of immigrants. Jim's parents were Armenian immigrants, and he and his brothers were raised in the house that uh, his father built right in Dearborn's South End. Uh, there, Jim knew and enjoyed the company of many first-generation Americans, uh, a familiar story again. And after serving his country in World War II, Jim would go on to work in the unemployment benefits office at the Fort Rouge plant for about 50 years, becoming a supervisor and taking personal interest in helping those who, like his parents, had difficulty understanding the language. Jim had many interests, but he loved his family above all else. His phone conversations always began with, how are you in the family? He was a steadfast, conscientious provider and a constant supporter and a loving parent. He wanted his children to learn how to think and would challenge them to do so uh, and, they, and consider things from all perspectives. He was an easygoing, gentle soul with a positive attitude, quick wit, and playful, rich sense of humor. He loved to laugh, and he loved to make others laugh. He did the greatest generation proud. Mr. Bijan, uh, Bijan was 97 years old when he passed on December 31st, 2020. All of the following donations were made to Salina Intermediate School in memory of Mr. Jim Bijan. The funds will be used to create new, a new and innovative outdoor learning space for the students. First, a donation of $15 by Francis and Lawrence Barlow. A donation of $20 by Barbara Bijan. A donation of $25 by Stephanie Caradian. A donation of $40 by David and Laura Strachan. A donation of $50 by Dorothy uh, Bartouche a donation of $50 by the Klein family, a donation of $50 by Rafi and Julie uh, Darmanulian, a donation of $75 by Maria and Charles Nagayan, a donation of $100 by Harry Stetzel, a donation of $100 by Christine and Andrew uh, Kozikian, a donation of $100 by Jean Tymek, a donation of $100 by Robert and Patricia Slagic. A donation of $200 by Alan and Yvette Klein and family. A donation of $1,000 by John and Chris Hauspian. And a donation of $1,000 by Ralph Miller and Yvonne Bijan. Those are the donations for this evening. Thank you. I'm in the community, uh, a great story about being able to give back to uh, those who gave to you. Next item, please. Next item is approval of minutes. Approval of minutes of the following Dearborn of Education meeting. Policy committee meeting, February 8th, 2021. Board to report 20-66. Regular P-12 meeting, February 8th. 2021, board report 20-67, finance committee meeting February 9th, board report 20-68, recommended action, make any necessary corrections, and move approval of these minutes. So moved. Support. I'll second, support. All right, we had a motion by Trustee Berry, supported by Trustee Petlichkoff. Any corrections that were needed? All right, seeing none, Trustee Mosep, can we do a roll call vote, please? Sure. Trustee Barry? Yes. Trustee D'Ambrasio? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Trustee Mosep? Yes. Trustee Petlishkoff? Yes. Trustee Watts? Yes. President Thorpe? Yes. Thank you. Next item, please. Special reports, food service update, Mr. Wall and Mr. Murphy and Mr. <laughs> Dean. Mr. On the food service department and Mr. Josh Bain will be doing the majority of the presentation and the other staff is there to support if there's any questions. Typically we do this in the month of March because every year required by MDE we have to approve the food service company if we're going to use one 
in usually April for the following year. So that's why we want to make sure we give the annual update now. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Bain. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to um, present to you. Let me see if I'm smart enough to share my screen here. <laughs> Just not always a given. All right, can you guys see me? Perfect. Well, um, you know, thank you again for um, giving us the opportunity to update you. This year has been anything um, but ordinary for us as in all the other departments in the district. Um, so we'd like to talk about um, kind of what we've done for the last 12 months, uh, what we're doing now and where we're headed. So um, as Mr. Wall said, um, I'm Josh Bain, the Director of Area Operations with SFE. And joining me here on the call uh, is Jeff Murphy, the district's long-term food service director, as well as Lee Collins, um, our director of operations for food service for the district, uh, who is celebrating her one-year anniversary here in the district this week, actually. So she came on at an exciting time. Um, not here on the meeting is the rest of our team. Um, first off, we have David Heidkamp. He's an associate general manager for us. Stacy Malash has been a long-term long district employee as the food service liaison. And Asmaki, our nutrition coordinator, has been very busy lately um, planning all of the menus for the district. And Chef Danny Seguir handles all of the culinary and kind of runs point on that for us. Here is a just really simplified organizational chart for the department, just kind of showing where our kitchens report up through um, the salaried leadership team. Um, and then just kind of an overview of what everyone does. I won't bore you by going into great detail on this one. Uh, we have a lot of moving parts in food service. Um, kind of things that we're wanting to talk about um, this evening are, um, you know, first off, we'll talk a little bit about our frontline staff. I want to talk about our COVID-19 feeding uh, that we've done over the last um, almost exactly one year now. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about numbers um, and then about some feedback from the community, uh, what we're doing in schools for the last few weeks, um, and then what we kind of see the rest of the year holding for us. For starters, um, I, I can't um, speak highly enough about our food service staff um, that has really gone above and beyond for the last 12 months um, as we you know, pivoted um, on very short notice from a you know, kind of traditional students coming through the serving line model uh, to an emergency feeding situation. Um, they have been there in you know, rain and snow and every other possible um, circumstance, uh, making sure that the needs of our community um, are met. Um, in large part, due to the great work that they've done, we've actually um, been able to keep everyone fully employed uh, with no positions eliminated or hours reduced, uh, which is almost unheard of for school nutrition departments um, over the last year. Uh, here's an overview of kind of what our department looks like as far as positions. Uh, we've got 10 managers and 21 satellite managers at our elementary schools. We've got 10 cooks, 10 bakers, 87 food service assistants, and 17 substitutes um, that are in the buildings each and every day. Um, and then here's a couple pictures just kind of showing some of the um, conditions that our staff has worked through. Um, the you know, larger picture there, the team at Lori uh, serving food in you know, a foot of snow, and then um, the crew over at Salina Intermediate um, meeting the same needs. So over the course of the pandemic for the last 12 months, we actually um, were able to provide seven days worth of breakfast and lunch um, throughout the course of the pandemic. The only interruption in service was over the winter holiday. Um, and we actually um, were able to see meal counts increase consistently um, over the course of the pandemic, which we'll look at here in just a moment. In addition to our regular meal items, we have been able to um, use the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which is a grant that the district has taken part in for a number of years. I believe this year is actually our highest funded year, and we've put that um, to good use, kind of exposing students to some different fresh fruits and vegetables that maybe they wouldn't have access to normally. Uh, the spirit of the grant is really to um, just introduce students at a young age to fresh produce and, and kind of foster a love for uh, those nutritious foods in them. We've had a lot of fun doing that um, and engaging the community through social media. Um, Chef Danny Seguir um, did some great videos on how to cut a pineapple that I know we used at my house. 
Um, we've really enjoyed kind of engaging students in non-traditional ways um, during a very non-traditional time. Now, moving on to kind of participation and revenue. Um, here is just a line showing the total number of meals served each month uh, from March through the end of February. In total, our, our ladies and gentlemen have put together um, 3,558,221,000 um, meals, which is just a mind boggling number. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful for our staff and, and that's you know, three and a half million meals that, that went to students and many of whom um, you know, don't have food security at home. So um, really been a, a great um, opportunity to meet, meet needs. Here's kind of a year over year look at participation, just showing how um, you know, the orange line is current year and the blue line is um, you know, just month over month prior year. Uh, we have actually served over half a million more meals this school year than we did over the same period last year. Uh, once again, that is a, a extremely unusual statistic for um, school nutrition departments. Most of them have um, really had a decrease in, in participation this year. We've been really fortunate to, um, to see that continue to, to um, stay strong. And then looking at dollars, transferring those meals, kind of translating them into the reimbursed dollars from the federal government. Uh, we're at a total of $1,905,000 of revenue by this point, um, more than we had in prior year. So we're in a very sound place financially. Uh, we're very thankful for that. It's um, you know, once again, a unique position. On top of our regular reimbursement revenue, uh, we have received year to date over $100,000 in grants from various sources. Um, we're using the surplus revenue in addition to grants uh, to really invest back in the department and you know, looking towards the long-term health of, of the food service department. So we've invested in new equipment and small wares. Um, we've bought lots of carts and different things for transporting food. Uh, we're in the process of getting specs for walk-in coolers at a number of campuses which will allow us to do um, even more fresh from scratch um, and on-site preparation once schools fully open back up. Um, in addition, I believe on the agenda tonight, a little farther down, uh, we're looking at purchasing three food transport vehicles. You know, we um, have always thought that community feedback, especially from students, is, is really key to putting together a successful food service program. It's, it's really a cornerstone of what we do is letting students dictate the direction we go. And um, in the past, we've taken for granted the fact that we can walk out into the cafeteria and talk to the students um, and do a focus group and sit in on student council meetings. Um, this year, uh, we didn't have the kids in the buildings. So we did put out a survey in September that got a um, really healthy response. We had um, over 1,200 responses from uh, parents and students about just the kind of state of our distribution program allowed people to give us feedback. We um, took what they had um, you know, to say quickly pivoted, changed our program, and almost immediately saw a 20% increase in, in revenue. So um, you know, we saw participation jump almost immediately. Um, it, it's good to know that we have you know, provided the best possible program for our families. As we are transitioning into a hybrid model, uh, we have plans to put out an additional survey next month. The last um, question on the survey was open-ended and just gave um, folks the opportunity to um, you know, kind of give us feedback and um, you know, ways that we can improve. And the overwhelming majority of them were uh, words of gratitude for our staff. And so I included a few of those here. Um, I'll go ahead and read them for you. So a McCullough Yunus parent said, we are very happy with it. Thank you so much. A Woodworth parent wrote, thank you for asking for feedback. We appreciate the hard work and effort to improve and meet the needs of our community. It has been a blessing to know that I can count on my children having healthy food every week in spite of all the other struggles 2020 has thrown at my family. God bless the ladies in the kitchen. And finally, we had a long parent write, this has been a wonderful service and a huge help. Not only does it help us financially, but it helps me with lunch ideas since the kids are home all the time now. Thanks so much for all of your hard work to serve our community. So um, it's always encouraging to get um, words from the, from the parents and we actually put all these together and share them with all of our kitchens. Uh, now talking about the um, present day for the last, um, starting last week, we have transitioned into the hybrid model. Um, for middle and high school students, we are offering a grab and go breakfast um, during their school day. So they can stop by, pick up a meal free of charge um, and then eat it at a designated time. Elementary students are doing lunch um, in the cafeterias. We are able to do a hot lunch, which we're excited about. 
Um, we're doing two choices currently of entree, along with a minimum of four fruit and vegetable options each day at each building. Uh, meal distribution hasn't stopped, it's just changed. Um, so we have switched our day to Wednesdays at all of the middle and high school campuses. Um, community members can still come and pick up meals for their uh, virtual or face-to-face -face students to make up seven total um, meals for breakfast and lunch each week. Just a few notes on kind of where we're heading next um, as department. As I mentioned, we're um, looking to do some surveys in the very near future um, to kind of help us better dial into what students are looking for during this hybrid phase. Um, in addition, we're really um, you know, thankful, as I said, our staff is all still here. All of our positions have remained. Uh, with less students in the building, we're gonna have a, a lot of time over the next few months to do some staff development. And so we have been intentionally planning ways to uh, really engage our staff and focus on culinary um, topics as well as compliance and safety and really look to the future um, and getting our staff prepared for you know, a full return to learn um, and really providing the best possible experience for our students. And finally, we've been piloting in Bryant Middle School, um, some adult meal ordering uh, we're going to be launching that district-wide in the very near future. That'll help uh, our teachers, especially in buildings that don't have kitchens up and running for lunch, um, still have access to, to meals during their busy days. And finally, um, just thank you all again for the partnership. It is truly um, a delight being part of the Dearborn community, um, getting to you know, continue to partner with you all. And um, now we'll open it up for any questions you may have. Shall I just go ahead and, instead of waiting to be called on? That works for me. Can, <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go go on ahead, Trustee McDonald. Okay, thank you, President Thorpe. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but one of my degrees is in culinary art, so I know how important and how um, involved it is as far as um, food safety. It covers everything from cross-contamination to uh, proper temperatures, swing marks, identifying droppings. I mean, it's very vast. So you touched on a little bit that you will be training your staff in that. And I noticed that you also have David who is kind of oversees that. But I want you to go into a little more depth of um, what you do to make sure that food safety is complied with. and how you continuously will train your staff to make sure that, because it's not just a one-time thing, it has to be on everybody's mind every day. Uh, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm just gonna let Lee speak to that. She um, has a lot of training experience and she can probably enlighten everyone a little bit. Sure, right now we currently have um, 10 managers, 11 managers that are going through the Serve Safe program. So they're um, going through, it's an online program that they're doing right now. So it takes about six, seven hours to go through it. And then, um, then they'll come and they'll come to the office and take a, a test that will certify them to say that they're Serve Safe certified so that we can, you know, prove that they have all that knowledge and make sure that they do. And we do a lot of daily coaching and making sure that we're following all the safety processes every day. So everything from temperature logs to rotation and all that kind of stuff is top of mind every day as we're all going from school to school and working with the teams. Thank you. I have another question too. Um, and it's kind of in general, right now I know things are so different than they normally are. But uh, the last time, or it may have been a while back when you did a presentation, I had asked about um, waste because that was one of the reasons that we brought your service in because our students were throwing away a lot of food and it doesn't do anybody good unless it gets into their bodies and you know nourishes them. So I had asked before, and I know that things have just been thrown up in the air and it's really hard to determine that considering that we're not having in-person um, and regular lunch. But I would like you just to keep it in mind that I would like an update on how we are doing as far as waste goes, um, how we know that we're doing better than we were before, and how that is basically measured. So just, I don't know if you could touch on it a little bit tonight, but I'm, 
I am interested in that kind of information in the future when we get back to some sense of uh, normality. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I can touch briefly on it. And then I think, as you indicated, um, once we kind of get back into normal, uh, we'll be able to update you all on that. Um, we, um, you know, we don't like waste either. Uh, if the students aren't eating it, then they're not getting the nutrition from it. Um, as you said, with the, you know, meals at home, it's a lot harder to gauge. Um, that's part of why we, we do things like surveys is so we can make sure that we're putting things that students really want. Um, on that front, we actually were working on um, different initiatives. Like we had a um, composting company that we were actually looking at um, partnering with and having actually composting some of our kitchen waste and things like that prior to um, COVID. And we'll start all those discussions back up now that we're seeing students come back into the buildings. Okay, thank you. Just real quick, commendations to you and your entire team. I think you've done uh, amazing work and you've really stepped up when the whole community has needed to be fed and you've done an outstanding job. So thank you for all your hard work. I appreciate it. And we'll be sure to um, pass on your, your kind words to our team. Trusty Watts. Um, yeah, just to follow up with what Trusty McDonald said, I. I totally appreciate all of your staff members being out there during this COVID, especially when it's probably hard on their families as well. So um, kudos to them and shout out for, um, for all of the hard work that they've been doing um, and putting the community ahead of their, probably their own needs. So thank you for all of that. Um, now I saw the meal distribution is now on Wednesdays. Is there ever um, opportunities, is there ever leftover food? And if there is leftover food from parents who don't pick up, where does that food end up? Yeah, that's a um, that's a great question. So, a large amount of what we're um, what we're utilizing now is, is items that are able to either be um, you know put into cold storage or frozen and utilized at a later date. Um, as far as the fresh items like you know, carrots or, or things like that, uh, one of the upsides to having students back in buildings is we'll be able to actually um, you know, reappropriate some of those items, um, you know, steam them for maybe our Thursday Friday students, um, things like that. I'm. I'm always impressed with our staff. They do a really great job of um, trying to do everything they can to, to minimize waste. They're very, very cost conscious. Trustee Moza. Yeah, uh, thank you. On, back in April, uh, when we started the distribution, uh, there was a lot of feedback as far as the food selection. So I'd like to hear on what changes were made and if um, uh, those changes were uh, resonating with parents and students, and as well as incorporating local foods or cultural foods in, in the menus, um, are those being taken into consideration as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, would Lee, would you like to speak to this one? Looks like we may have frozen up. All right, can you guys still hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Then I'll, I'll take it. Um, no, I think that that was um, you know a big part of why we went ahead and did a survey um, early last fall was to uh, really gauge what what people were wanting, um, and that's really how we identified you know what we wanted to include in the meal kits moving forward. We made a shift towards a lot more bulk items, um, items that were you know, easier to prepare for multiple students at once, things like that. Um, we also, uh, you know, speaking of you know, cultural um, foods, we had a lot of feedback on our hummus, um, the hummus recipe that we were utilizing at the um, you know, beginning of emergency feeding was um, not a fan favorite. We were able to um, kind of go back to the drawing board, um, you know, find a recipe with a lot more tahini and garlic. Um, and that um, definitely resonated with the community um, you know, we're always, always looking to, to keep improving. And now that we have students back in buildings, we'll be able to expand menu options even more. Any additional questions? Trustee Barry. Not a question, but a comment. Uh, uh, last night I went out to dinner with my daughter and just two of us and our order was screwed up. Uh, trying to feed 22,000 students on a daily basis, that's amazing work. Then you stepped up during this past year, you and your team, uh, it was mind-boggling what you were able to do. Not only send you know, 
food packages to our students' houses. But from what I understand, uh, rules and regulations we were put under that we couldn't turn anybody away. So kudos to you and your team on that. Uh, the other thing that was very important to me, and I think it was very important to most of us, I didn't see what usually happens when people are serving the community, you know, selfies and taking pictures of people coming to pick up food. So uh, that does not go unrecognized. Uh, I'm on social media. I didn't see any pictures. I didn't see any employees. That was very important to me, and I shared that with Dr. Maleko in the beginning. So uh, I appreciate that. So thank you, and thank you to your team. One more quick comment, um, if I may. I just wanted to also thank your team for not only um, the, the video that was done with pineapple, I know that they have done some things to get families cooking together. And I think that's a really great thing to do, especially when we're kind of locked in together. It gives people a chance to do something that maybe they haven't done before, try something new. And of course, get kids a, a love of not only learning, but cooking, being in the kitchen and sharing what they've been able to produce. So thanks for that too. And I hope you continue doing those kind of things. Absolutely, we have um, definitely enjoyed kind of dabbling with um, some multimedia approaches. So uh, definitely more to come. Thank you. And I would expand on what was said earlier, thanking all the employees that, that made this happen. They were working all through the summer, but when the pandemic first hit, we were also asking for community volunteers and PTAs and other groups stepped up to help out. In fact, there were several Fridays that I spent over at Dearborn High working uh, with Ms. Collins, and she was telling me what I had to put in the bag and stop giving away so much ranch dressing to people. <laughs> so uh, I can't believe it's been a year. I'm glad that that year has passed. But uh, thank you to SFE and our food service employees for everything they do. Next item, please. Citizen participation. Citizens wishing to address the board on agenda and non-agenda item for action can submit a virtual blue card until that will be posted at 4 p.m. on Monday, March 8, 2021, and the district's websites. DearbornSchools.org slash district slash board dash of dash education. Or in person who are signed in by 7.10 p.m. by submitting a blue card to the secretary will be read by the board secretary. The board may not be in position to respond to non-agenda items. Therefore, speakers should not anticipate an immediate response to their comments or questions. For the benefit of all concerned, do not mention the names of students or school district employees. Please keep your comments as brief as possible. The board president reserves the right to limit times. Uh, Mr. President, I don't have any blue cards physically, but I do have virtual blue cards. So I, I'll start reading them. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tracy Baggi of Dearborn mm -hmm. says, I noticed food service is on the agenda item. So I wanted to give them a shout out. While everything else ground to stop for COVID, they kept on trucking. The food that they have been providing is a huge benefit to so many in, in our community. The kids love food day so they can see what is in the bags this time. They love the giant homemade pizzas. Before the pandemic food was so good too. Many options. Very fresh. The kids are excited for lunchtime. Altogether, a great experience for children. The staff works hard to give fruit, fresh fruit and veggies and lots of food that, that kids actually want to eat. Same before the pandemic. So much good food and healthy food. It makes me proud to be in Dearborn Schools. That's great to hear. Uh, Mr. Nassar Saeed of Dearborn said, to whom it may concern. We all understand that education has been a little hectic during this pandemic. I would like to share my concerns with you as a parent of two children in the Dearborn public school system. One is in third grade and the other is a senior and they are both advanced and one of the top in their classes. Even though their education has been always a priority of our family, their safety is my highest responsibility. 
As of now, I do not feel it is safe for my children to go back to in-person learning or any, per, or any student for that matter. My own children refuse to go back because they know it's not safe. They feel a sort of pressure to go back to in-person. I'm disgusted that the school board is trying to send our children back in these unsafe conditions. I believe that the district needs to focus on their promise of students first because that is what is not currently happening. The community is being led astray by misleading positivity numbers that sent out by the district. Dearborn is still a main hotspot, whether at a risk level E or D. If my child came home with either one of those grades on their report cards, I would be furious. How do you expect parents and students to feel safe when the risk level is basically an equivalent to a failing grade? Additionally, the district uses Wayne County reports, not Dearborn alone, which I'm sure the positivity rate would be much higher for considering that we are a known hotspot city. If I hadn't researched the numbers on my own, then I would have never known the case levels in Dearborn, while other parents are still in the dark. When it was decided to go back, the numbers were in range that the board previously agreed on. Now the positivity percentage is higher than those guidelines again. The district is going against their own word just to rush students back into the classroom faster. Most of us have adapted to online learning for the time being. So why send our children back and risk their lives? As a final message, I firmly believe that the district should reevaluate their decision and keep our children safe. Uh, just as a correction, I believe, um, to set the facts straight, we're still in 4.8 as of last week, Superintendent Maleko, correct? So that is still below the 5% yeah. that we've set. Okay. Uh, Mrs. S. of Dearborn said, uh, my husband and I are both working parents and are extremely disappointed with the schedule. Our kids are in elementary and attend Dearborn Public Schools in the east end of Dearborn. We are having an extremely hard time getting our kids to school due to the schedule. My wife begins work at 8 a.m. and I begin work at 9. My wife has to rush during her break to take the kids to a friend's house so they walk to school. Students cannot be in the building before 9.30. There is no before or after school latch key. I really hope that the board will reconsider the schedule or help working parents. If not, then we have no choice but to enroll our kids in the VLP. Please reconsider the schedule. Um, Mr. Tariq Baidun of Dearborn says, thanks for the opportunity to address the Dearborn Thanks for the opportunity to address the board as a concerned lifelong Dearborn resident and now as a parent and a homeowner. My question is, with such a municipal risk to their students and staff alike, especially those who are vaccinated, is the disruption and trauma to our children caused by the historical fear of COVID-19 justified? If so, how will the masks and social distancing impact our children's learning in the short term and the long term. Thank you for your all continued service. Mrs. Samar Mansour, I believe of Dearborn says, what is in the current plan as the city of Dearborn is back at risk level E and cases are rising on a daily basis. There are new teachers who are not eligible for any types of leave who fear the possibility of bringing the virus back home to their loved ones, even though they are vaccinated. When those teachers applied for VLP back in October, they were told it was unfair to students for the teacher to move in the middle of the school year, even after teachers were encouraged to apply anyway. There is also the fact of students, teachers, and even principals are able to keep their mask on when visitors are present in the building, but the visitors are not there all day. 
how does it seem so easy to claim that everyone is doing a great job with the masks? Parents are upset about the kids <clears throat> going back to school and do not, want, do not want them back in the classroom, but can't do anything about, be, about it because they feel it is unfair to switch their children's or their child's teacher this far into the school year. When we asked for schools to open, we didn't mean we wanted to add more stress to, on our kids and their teachers. We also have an anonymous comment that is concerned also with the reopening at the E rating. Those are the end, that's the end of public comments. Thanks. I'll take a minute or two with some of the comments. First off, just a reminder, any comment that is submitted anonymously, we are just going to uh, briefly talk about what the subject in we're, is. We're not going to read the full comment during the public meeting, but it will be in our minutes and it is available for all the board to read at their convenience. Uh, there was a couple of points that were being brought up about positivity and the county matrix. What this board had decided was once we originally hit the 5% positivity rate, then the positivity rate was no longer going to be a metric that we were going to use to decide if we were going to stay open. We were going to use the county as the, the, the sole metric. While at, we we're at a level D, we just moved back to level E. That is one thing that we look at. The superintendent has the right to ask the county health department for uh, their thoughts on it. Dr. Maleko did reach out to the county health department about it. As he stated earlier, it is our belief that most of these are uh, the cases that are cropping up are either through the community spread or through uh, after school activities, specifically sports, not through in person instruction. So that means that at this point, we do not need to close the district down, but we have the ability, whether it is as a board or the superintendent himself has the powers to close the district if the um, the spread gets to a level where we feel it is warranted. Do you want to make any additional comments on that? Trustee Barry. I'm not going to address any of the comments. I just want to make a generic statement. Uh, uh, balance seems to be the magic word this year for me personally. And I know from the get-go, uh, we did our best to protect our community members, especially the older ones, uh, our best to protect our teachers and the rest of us staff. Uh, uh, I heard the CEO of DMC earlier mention, uh, Ms. Cassie, Kathy Donovan mentioned behavioral health issues. That is real. We've talked about this at a couple other meetings uh, previously. Uh, mental health, social health is very important. There's no doubt in my mind because I live that life. I've talked to a lot of parents. I have a couple uh, middle schoolers in my house and it was getting pretty bad. So. Yeah, the kids need to get back into school. Now there are parents that are still a little hesitant uh, and didn't get into the VLP. Uh, we're making it possible. If the logistics is there, reach out to your, your principal. But I feel like we're getting penalized for offering an option. If you don't want your kids back in school, that, that, that's not acceptable. I mean, we're dealing here with 33 buildings, 22,000 plus students, you know, 2,700 staff members that we're responsible for. And we're still reaching out to you and say, what do you want? So I think maybe a thank you once in a while is appreciated. But if you're not, if you don't want your students in the classroom, please reach out to the principals. They are doing an amazing job, like I said. Again, right now it's time for the balance. We know our students have fallen behind educationally. And I know I heard numerous of times where Trustee Petrikov, my other colleagues, myself, were directing Dr. Maleko to say, put a plan together to get our, and I know they are. I know there's no doubt in my mind we get the reports. There is a plan to get the students, you know, to catch up educationally. But it's very important right now, very, very important also to keep an eye on our students, their mental health. So. I wasn't answering any of the comments, but I just wanted to make that comment, please. Thank you. One other thing that, that I'll bring up, we had the presentation on food service, and then we also heard a comment on food service. Dr. Maleko, do you want to mention about the, the uh, announcements that are going out regarding the SNAP nutrition program? Sure. There, the SNAP is not 
operated by the district, and I can't remember to Mr. Wall, or I sh we should have mentioned the amount, but we did put out on our PR uh, that that benefit is available to parents um, during the pandemic, um, so that that, but that is sent out directly through the state. Uh, we don't have any direct involvement in that benefit for parents and their students. Um, we put out information to help parents get there. Um, so that is another, you know, added benefit during the pandemic. Um, and again, we've put that, the details are all out on our social media and our communication. So um, I'm glad that the government is, you know, providing support for families. If I could just add to that, and I appreciate the comments of the, uh, President Thorpe and Trustee uh, Barry. Uh, yeah, I think um, with the, you know, not to necessarily go into all, all the specifics, but just uh, with the general uh, comments, I think we've been very, as uh, Trustee Barry, you said, um, we've been very accommodating. We've done our best. We are a large district, as you said, you know, to move staffing and, and on, uh, you know, because someone decided yesterday they want to switch. Well, the reality is if I don't have a teacher, I can't just put a student into a class where I don't have somebody. That's why we tried to do the advanced placement. And as far as with staff, I mean, we opened it up to all staff back in August. And so anyone, we were actually looking for more staff to get in. Yet yeah, it is true that we don't want to disrupt during the year. And that's why we also are hiring more teachers because we know, um, you know, uh, that we will probably have more retirements and, and we're seeing that data across the state. So I think we've been very proactive. Um, we, we back then in trustee, our, uh, President Thorpe, you mentioned, you know, we had the first window in August for parents and we understood that, you know, there were decisions that parents had to be ma made. And then October, we made it really clear. And I remember you saying at the time you were President Barry, uh, look, you know, here's the thing, the plan is there, everyone knows. If you know you do not want your child <coughs> in no matter what, please enroll now because you know, we're trying to accommodate, and I will give my team credit, both with the teachers and with the administration, whether that's Mason or Dr. Chokol, uh, the union worked with us on this, Mr. Higgins, they all worked very hard. The principals, you said the principals. This has been very, uh, a lot of pressure on the principals to change staffing mid-year. It's not, and, and I've talked to parents and I've tried to explain, and again, we're down to now maybe only 200 on a waiting list of, like I said, 6,000 plus that have enrolled in this program. And a lot decided to do it in January and we still accommodate even though we said we may not be able to guarantee it. So I feel very good about the fact that we've really been fair. Uh, and again, remember, we're all dealing with the pandemic too. So moving a district this size, and I did, I talked to one of the media outlets about that, um, but, but I appreciate the support of the board. Uh, again, the great work of administrators. I think when I told them, you know, you got to look to try to accommodate more parents, it was pressure on them, but they stepped up. They really did. And so I give uh, our team credit there and I thank everyone for their support. And we're gonna continue to, to attempt to, uh, you know, uh, provide support. The vaccines, I think are a huge thing. And I think the fact that I just said to you, I was in the buildings, I see it firsthand, the safety protocol, it is safe. It's being, the clean, clean, it's being cleaned in the buildings. Everybody is stepping up. Um, and so I've seen it firsthand in multiple buildings the, the last two work, weeks. We will monitor it, and if something changes or adjusts, we'll make those appropriate decisions. But right now, I believe, uh, as you mentioned, mentioned social, emotional, and mental health, kids are so excited to be in schools, and those parents that ch chose to stay home, they had that option. And they still, you know, like you said, contact the principal. So I think we've been very accommodating of all, and some kids want to be back in. But it is safe from what I've seen. It is very safe in the schools, and I'm very proud of our staff, so thank you.